Hi Church, my name is Folu and I'm so excited to bring a message to you tonight. It's from a verse in the Bible that I've recently been drawn to again. I absolutely love it when we read the Word of God and it speaks to us in new ways than before. God is able to reveal the new layers to us in such interesting ways. And when He does this, it's so important that we actually stop, we pause, we reflect, and we meditate on what He is saying and ask ourselves, why is He pulling me there? So I'd like to encourage you to take notes tonight and look at where God is prompting you and take time this week to pray for those areas. And before we start tonight, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you that God, we have your word, which brings us truth, hope, life, and healing. God, I pray that as we gather this evening, we have hearts that are softened, opened, and surrendered. God, speak to us in the ways in which only you can do. In your name we pray, amen. So like many of you, I have been doing a lot of pausing and reflecting in this really quite a difficult season. Starting early spring with our global health pandemic and in more recent weeks, having some of the most transparent and raw conversations on racism, oppression and injustice. And for many black people, it's been a real unveiling of the painful and suppressed lived experiences. Sometimes we've had to discuss things and uproot the lies that have been dressed up as truths. For others, it's been an awakening to the pain that black people have experienced and the realities of the complex world in which we all live in. But there are no coincidences. Despite the difficult times we've found ourselves in, I really believe it's produced a useful backdrop for us to recenter, realign, and really seek the heart of God. I personally feel so much freer having had many of life's supposed norms and comforts stripped away from me. And I'm left feeling encouraged because irrespective of the trials around us, the changes and the challenges, our God has not changed. He is the same God yesterday, today and tomorrow because God transcends time. His goodness, His mercy and His importance is the same today as it was 2,000 years ago. God is also omnipresent. His power, authority and reign is everywhere, all at the same time. So whilst we're here in the present day, July 2020, we need to remember that God is with us today and also in our August 2020, in our December 2020 and beyond. So let's remember that when we find ourselves in life struggling, it's of no surprise to God. God will use these experiences to refine us and to reveal who He really is. And actually we're gonna be formed in His likeness because of our trials. Nothing is ever wasted with God. The title of this message is Born in a Battlefield. I know it may sound a bit intense, I am Nigerian, but so much of what we are born into and are currently living is a battle. The first part of this message will unpack the battles that were faced in the early church. And the second part will demonstrate the keys that we can use today to fight our battles. Let me read to you, Acts 9, verse 31. It says here, Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. So from the get-go, the book of Acts is full of power. There is action, change, movement, momentum. And we see what we know as the birth of the early church and the mass infilling of the Holy Spirit. And these things should mean that great things are happening. And great things did happen. But as the words and the verses and the chapters unfold, we also see challenge, pain and strife. But alongside these challenges, we're also seeing a way that we are called to live by as Christians. As Christ followers, we are called to a higher standard. And that way of living is different to the world. The birth of the church brought persecution, active, deliberate persecution. And it seems strange to think that the birth of something amazing could experience direct conflict and opposition, but it highlights that we are in a battle. From the beginning of time, as seen in the book of Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, we have been in a battle because Adam and Eve fell out of relationship with God 
and sin entered the world. But Ephesians 6, 12 says this. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And I know that sounds pretty epic, but it's in the Bible. We are definitely in a battle, but it's not one of flesh and blood. It's a battle for our minds and for our souls. The battle is real, but it isn't always visible with our natural eyes. In the Bible, we also see persecution in the birth of Jesus Christ himself. We see him and his parents fleeing because of the threats that were placed on his life as an unborn child, and him having to be born outside in a farmyard animal feeder. But we also see how awesome things can be born in the battlefield. Now I appreciate we've all had to navigate this lockdown in different ways, which has reduced some of our everyday freedoms. But generally speaking, most of us don't know what real persecution is. But in Acts, in their every day, the church was under the pressure of continuous attempts to pull it down. Paul, who was previously known as Saul, is seen as a central figure in the persecution of the church doing so in order to protect the religious rulers and authorities of Judaism, which is entirely contrary to what Jesus came to do. But in Saul's mission, he had in mind if he could put Christians in prison, he could have them judged. And if he could have them judged, he could have them killed. And that was what Saul sought to do, to bring honour to God. The Bible says in John 10, 10, that Jesus came to give us all life and life more abundantly. And that promise is not just for a select few, not for those who were born into Judaism, but it's for each and every one of us. However, even though Jesus was born to be the saviour of the world, in order to do that, he needed to tear down the old ways of thinking, tear down the old ways of living and establish a new way of thinking, living, acting, and that is the kingdom of God. And that kingdom of God has been ordained by God and spoken into existence, but is yet to fully manifest itself on earth as it is in heaven. And that is why we still have and experience pain, struggle, heartache, oppression, lies, darkness, and why the battle is still here today. In Acts 9.31, we see five distinct things that happened after the church was persecuted. And I find them so encouraging as they're things that we can actually use on earth now as we navigate our own battles. 
Because truth be told, even once one battle has finished, it's not often not long after another one will then surface. And the battle may not look like we think it ought to, but it's still very real. And as believers, we need to ensure we have the right posture to fight. We also need to remember that God works in ways that are countercultural to our earthly thoughts and our earthly approach. God calls us to fight our battles in a different way, and it starts with our posture. So perhaps ask yourself right now, wherever you're sat, what posture are you in? Are you in one that has both fists held up high, or with arms stretched out wide, or with your mouth tight-lipped, gripped with apprehension over what's coming next? I wouldn't blame you for feeling any or all of those things, and many of us would feel exactly the same way. Acts 9.31 tells us about a posture that is full of peace, edification, the fear of God, and a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. So let's look at each of those in turn and see these keys and how they can help us fight our battles. So point number one, peace. Peace is a gift from God. Psalm 29.11 says that the Lord blesses His people with peace, which sounds fantastic, doesn't it? Peace is not the absence of trouble, but it's the acknowledgement that Jesus is in there with us in that struggle. And we see an awesome example of this in the book of Daniel, chapter three, where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to bow down to the king Nebuchadnezzar, and they're thrown into a fiery furnace. But there was a peace upon them. They had a peace that their God would deliver them. And not only did he do that, but he was right there in the fire with them. Peace is a gift from God, and peace is the confident protection of God. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 7, that God will give us a peace that transcends all understanding. And this will guard our hearts and minds. This verse reminds me of a time in my life a few years ago. One of my brothers was knocked down in a near fatal car incident. He went through an increasingly troubling time following that. As a family, we were really quite concerned for him. Though it was amazing that God had protected him and had spared his life that day. Some months later, I got a message from a friend of his saying that they were really worried about my brother and that no one had been able to reach their him for some hours and they just thought he'd not been the same person since the accident. Basically, they were saying he had come to the end of himself and they were just so worried about him. I remember in that moment realizing I had a choice to make either to turn up what the Word of God says, His truth, His hope, His protection, or tune into the fear that was being spoken over the situation and over my brother's life. And I remember rushing home, praying all the way, getting to my bedroom, being on my knees, and just continuing to pray and to worship. And as I did so, I was filled with a sense of confidence that despite that bad report, God was going to come through. And literally some moments later, my brother texted me and said that everything was fine. Very chilled by the whole thing. And he was fine, nothing to worry about. And I had no idea what happened that day. I can't explain how the situation went from being so difficult to being absolutely fine. But what I can say is the peace of God transcended my earthly understanding and it helped guard my heart and my mind. So we need a posture of peace to help us fight our battles. Point number two, the church was edified. Edification takes people. It takes everyday people like you and I who are called to speak life, speak truth and speak hope, to use words of wisdom and prophecy over each other and recognise that as believers, we must all take hold of this, this spirit. It isn't for people who are paid members of staff or who are leaders to do this, but actually it's for us all to be involved. And as we uh, meet as groups online or groups in homes, it's a great space for us to build up the body of Christ, corporately and also individually, to operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, to speak in heavenly languages. This stirs up our faith. This fixes our eyes on God. We need edification to help us fight our battles. Point number three, the church had a fear of God. We, the church, need to not just remember, but actually embrace and fully accept that we've been called to a different standard. 
We need to walk in the knowledge and fear of the Lord. This does not mean that we are simply scared of God, but instead that we have such an awe, a wonder and a reverence for him that we put this at the forefront of any opinion of man. We don't look to our left or to our right trying to impress man, but instead we fix our eyes on God and God alone. Walking in the fear of God means doing life in a way that glorifies him. And this should be evident in our lives as a fruit of our relationship with him. So ask yourself, what does this look like? For me, I think it looks like surrender. Surrender to God's standards, not a worldly, political, sociological, man-made standard. Proverbs 8.13 puts it like this, all who fear the Lord will hate evil. So when we see evil in the world, such as racism, corruption, or any form of abuse, we can see that God's heart is clearly against that. And so should we be, because we walk in the fear of the Lord. You know, a lot of us are Christians here, and making a decision for Jesus is one thing, but walking in the obedient fear of God and taking up our cross daily is a conscious, intentional decision to keep us focused on the battlefield. Point number four, the church had the comfort of the Holy Spirit. In order to feel the comfort of the Holy Spirit, we need to acknowledge the Holy Spirit, recognize who he is, a person, part of the three persons that make up our God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Knowing that the Holy Spirit is a gift given to us, for us to relate to, learn from, celebrate with, and actually to help us live an empowered life. Having an intimacy with the Holy Spirit is something that we can all experience, not just once, not just when we make our decision for Jesus and we're saved or we're baptized in water, but this can be an everyday overflow of God's power and presence in our lives. And God wants for us to operate in the fullness of His power, because without the Holy Spirit, it's as though we have just enough of God to not go backwards, but not the fullness of God that we need to step into all that He has for us. Because when the battle comes, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, intimacy with the Holy Spirit is crucial. When the Holy Spirit is at work, there is an ease to these keys for battle. When the Holy Spirit is at work, the church has peace. When the Holy Spirit is at work, the church is edified. When the Holy Spirit is at work, the church walks in the fear of God. By having a correct, Christ-centered posture, we come into battle in a new way, a Jesus way. And as these things all play out, peace, edification, having a fear of God, and comfort of the Holy Spirit, the church multiplied. So be encouraged. We are not fighting the battle in the way in which you might think. We need to lean into God more now than ever before, trust in His ways, in His thoughts, which are higher than ours. And in doing so, my prayer is that we, the church, will again multiply as multitudes will come to know their Heavenly Father and have eternity with Him. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light So from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the world From the throne of endless glory To the cradle in the dark
hope this message has spoken to each of us tonight. I hope that you've been able to see some of these keys and how you can apply them to fighting your battles. But right now, I'd really love to speak to two groups of people. The first being those who are hearing about Jesus for the first time. And the second, those who have been aware of Jesus but have been far from him. In the book of Acts, we read about Saul going out of his way to persecute Jesus and his church. But it was not until Saul encountered Jesus himself that he repented of his old ways, of his sin, and chose to follow Jesus instead. And the thing is, you don't have to be persecuting the church to be far from Jesus. I mentioned earlier on that in the Garden of Eden, sin entered the world, and this brought a separation between God, our Creator, and us, His creation. It's only through Jesus Christ coming to earth and dying on our cross for our sins, taking on our sin and our shame, and being raised from the dead, that we can now have salvation, and we are promised an eternity with our Heavenly Father. This is known as the Gospel, the Good News. And this invitation for salvation is not for select few, but it's an open invite for all men and women. So if that's you, sat at home, thinking about accepting Jesus into your heart, ready to surrender your life to Jesus, then I would love to pray with you right now. And I just ask if any of you at home who already have made this decision, just unite in prayer with us as well. Dear Jesus, Thank you so much for being our Lord and our Saviour. Thank you for taking my sins on your body at the cross and for rising again from the dead. Lord, I acknowledge my need of you. I turn away from my old ways and I turn to you. Help me to live a life that honours you the remaining days of my life. Amen. Now, if you've just prayed that prayer, we are genuinely so, so excited for you. That is the best decision that you could ever make. And we're gonna move back into a time of worship. And as we do so, I really pray God will continue to speak to us all and do mighty, mighty things in our lives.